So we got together today to talk about the important issue of methane emissions in the oil and gas sector. And indeed climate conversations this week will be a lot about methane emissions ahead of the publication that is foreseen on Thursday um, on the global methane assessment by the United Nations Environment Program and the Climate Clean Air and Clean Air Coalition. Um, and not very surprisingly, it says that uh, methane emissions, reducing methane emissions is one of the most cost effective strategies to rapidly reduce the rate of uh, global warming. It is the second biggest contributor to climate change after carbon dioxide. And while it stays in the atmosphere for a shorter period of time, it is 86 times more potent than CO2 over 20 years. And the European Union, but also the United States, the bo both are major players <laughs> in the gas market are drafting their own regulations to tackle methane emissions that are due to be released um, towards the end of this year. And in the European um, Union, under the European Green Deal, there was the methane strategy published last year, and the methane regulation is due to be um, proposed towards the end of the year. And a public consultation concerning the EU methane regulation just ended a few days ago, and we are now entering the next phase. So that's kind of the, the um, political context to uh, set the stage for the debate. With regards to the plan for the next 90 minutes, we will first have um, uh, a few welcoming remarks by the executive director of the Deutsche Umwelthilfe, and then we will have an introduction by our um, host. So again, this is actually meant to be a parliamentary event by Jutta Paulus. We will then have um, a rep representative from the European Commission who will tell us about the status quo of the implementation of the methane strategy in the European Union. Then um, a representative from Deutsche Umwelthilfe will tell us about a market survey and how companies in the fossil gas sector are already tackling methane emissions today. Um, then we will hear about um, the regulatory options that are on the table right now from a representative from the Environmental Defense Fund. And then we will move to a panel discussion where, um, as I said, I will also forward some of your questions to our panelists. And the panel discussion will also be joined by a representative from the um, fossil gas industry. So without further ado, I now pass the floor to Sascha Müller-Krenner, who is the executive director of the Deutsche Umwelthilfe, for a few welcoming remarks. So please, Sascha, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Lisa, for, for the kind introduction and uh, welcome from my side and to all of you and uh, to everyone in the virtual audience and obviously to all the speakers. And uh, my thanks also go to Jutta Paulus, a uh, member of the European Parliament for sponsoring this event and obviously to our partners at the Heinrich Ball Foundation. It's, it's a real pity we cannot do this in the European Parliament building first because we could be in Brussels. But secondly, also because the European Parliament will also obviously have to play an important role in the implementation of the methane strategy in the coming, coming years. And Lisa, you already aptly described the questions that we are facing, the huge potential that we have to cost effectively reduce methane emissions, not only to focus on CO2, but also on the other greenhouse gas gases. And uh, when we look at the short term horizon or medium term horizon that we have over the next decades, uh, the focus on methane is uh, particularly important. Now, um, uh, you, you've, you've all seen the invitation, you know what we uh, want to discuss and Lisa already summarized it. Let me just add one other aspect and most of you will have um, followed the media in the last days. Uh, we had a constitutional court ruling in Germany, well, partly instigated by our organization on that declared parts of Germany's climate law to be unconstitutional. And uh, the, the, basic, uh, uh, the basic argument of uh, the Constitutional Court has been that uh, the climate uh, legislation that we have in place right now uh, basically uh, uh, well sets a carbon budget that, uh, uh, that uh, impacts the right of future generations to make sovereign decisions on their own carbon budgets. So they define it as an issue of freedom that uh, the, the, the kind of slow progress that we're making on climate policy is taking away the freedom to act from future generations and therefore we have to act faster. We cannot wait until 2030 but we have to take, take measures now. And that brings me to the issue of methane because uh, obviously as we all know, uh, well uh, carbon, carbon dioxide is a very long lasting climate gas which lasts in the atmosphere for well 200 years and uh, and uh, when we want to have a short-term effect 
on and if we really want to get close to the 1.5 degree uh, that are enshrined in the Paris Agreement, then uh, there is no alternative than acting boldly on, on methane emus emissions right now. Uh, we are now at 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, so we have 0.4 to go and 0.3 of those uh, would already be um, uh, uh, eaten up uh, if we do not reduce uh, methane emissions uh, by in, in, in the next uh, years. So um, this has been a, a ruling uh, that uh, covers uh, German climate legislation, but uh, I think it has uh, it will have an impact beyond beyond Germany on the European Union. We have a number of similar legal cases. Uh, we had a similar ruling in France. Uh, we have legal cases pending at the, the European Court of Human Rights. So this is a this is a Europe-wide debate that we have. Uh, whether the climate policy that we have uh, is um, well um, compatible with the European treaties, whether it's compatible with uh, the European Green Deal, whether it's compatible with constitutions and freedom rights that we have enshrined in our constitutions in the member states. So, so let, let me leave it at that. I'm really very much looking forward to, to the conversation. I'm very much looking forward to different approaches putting, uh, that will be put forward by the discussants and uh, the charm of this event to me seems to be that uh, not everyone will be of the same opinion, at least I don't expect that. So I'm excited to be part of that conversation for the next uh, uh, 90 minutes and uh, back to you, Lisa. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm also looking forward to a debate and I mean it wouldn't be a real debate if we all were of the exact same opinion. Um, so for the uh, introduction, I now pass the floor to um, the MEP Jutta Paulus. She became a member of the European Parliament back in 2019, and she has since been serving on the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, which is also the lead committee for an own initiative report on the EU methane strategy that is due next month, so in June. And Jutta is the Parliament's co-rapporteur um, on that methane strategy, and she is also a substitute member um, of the ITRE committee, which is um, the associated committee on the file. So please, Jutta, the next five minutes are yours. Thank you again for hosting this event. Yes, my pleasure, Lisa. It's, it's really great that we have so many interested people here. And um, I think it is of high time that the problem of methane emission is finally getting more public attention. Um, right now, methane is responsible for about 25% of global warming already. And it has already been said on a 20 year time frame, methane is 87 times as strong as CO2 and 15% of the required emission cuts in the Paris Agreement could already be eliminated with low cost, technically feasible methane mitigation in the oil and gas sector. Um, you have already said where there is a methane initiative report being drawn up by the ENVI committee in the lead with the ITRA committee being associated. And unfortunately, I'm not a co-rapporteur, but only a shadow. So we, um, I will have to wait for the draft report by the Rapporteur Ms. Biraki from the EPP, but we have already been in close exchange and in many things we are on the same page. For example, I'm convinced that we must use, this is pretty nerdy, that we must use Article 192 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, which deals with the environment, because this is an environmental issue. We are not talking only about climate change although this would be a reason in itself, but also on uh, about air pollution. Methane is an important precursor for ozone formation, for example, which um, is very important for the health of citizens in Europe. Um, on the long run, it might even be possible to include methane in the EU emission trading system, which is quite difficult because it's much more difficult to measure it correctly than CO2, where you only have to look at the fuel being burned. Um, but I'm very convinced that we should put it right now into the industrial emissions directive, and it is, as I said, a precursor for air pollution and 
all air pollutants should be covered by the Industrial Emissions Directive, at least all air pollutants that are um, generated by industrial appliances, also by industrial animal farming, for example. We have a great program in the EU when it comes to monitoring methane emissions. And I'm talking, of course, of Copernicus, our satellite program, which has helped to monitor methane emissions and the hotspots of methane emissions worldwide. And I think this is something that we really should build on and we should use this data by um, and, and use this public data, which can be used by anyone and not refrain to private bodies only. I know that there are quite some actors already there saying, well, we can do wonderful methane certification for you. But I think certification should be something that should be left to public bodies. Um, the EU needs to be strong on methane emissions from the oil and gas sector. But, but unfortunately, most of these emissions are not taking place within the EU, but are upstream emissions by the supply countries. Therefore, we have to look at the imports and we have to um, reflect how can we put, well, pressure on the supply chain in order to make sure that we are not just exporting, so to speak, our emissions. We are doing everything here, but um, in other countries, nothing happens. So we need to be strong on these upstream emissions, but not forget what we are doing at home. So in the revision of the industrial emission directive, we should make sure that it is in line with the methane, methane strategy. And of course, also the revision of the or let's say the whole fit for 1.5 package, which is coming up in July, should have this methane um, chain in the, in the background. Because of course, when we're talking about, for example, hydrogen production, which is today mostly product, uh, produced from fossil gas, then we cannot say, well, we'll just use blue hydrogen, capture all CO2, and then we're fine. No, we're not, because we will not be able to capture the upstream methane emissions, which largely uh, which enlarged the footprint of blue hydrogen. So we should apply sustainability criteria where we look at how many tons of CO2 equivalent are attributed to certain fuels or to certain regulations. And there I would advocate for 195 euros per ton of CO2 equivalent. This is the current um, value which was calculated by the German Umweltbundesamt, Environmental Agency of Germany, public agency. And they even said this 195 um, is derived from the future damage cost of 640 euros per CO2 equivalent. So they're, um, they're calculating it down saying, okay, if you put this money into the bank today, then you will have 640 euro and 2,100. I don't know whether this will be true, but we should make sure that the sustainability criteria which are applied in the Renewable Energy Directive, in the Energy Efficiency Directive, and everything that's coming up now are aligned with this um, demand. We are also talking about um, the international sector. There is the OGMP, the Oil and Gas Methane Partnership, which has already started to work on methane emissions and on mitigating methane emissions. But um, in my view, they should apply EU standards because UNEP is still voluntary as we speak and EU should walk forward and say, we apply our standards also to our imports and therefore um, have a strong voice in the oil and gas methane partnership. I will not talk about waste and agri in this meeting because this is about um, the fossil fuel sector, of course. We should um, make sure that we don't forget those sectors because they are um, the agri sector is the largest source of methane in the European Union. But we should also um, keep in mind that we must do something with abandoned landfill sites and abandoned coal mines, which are hotspots of methane production today. Um, and last but not least, although we only have 
fairly little production of oil and gas in the European Union, we still need a very strong leak, leak detection and repair regulation for those sources that we have. We cannot say to the rest of the world, well, you have to do something about methane mitigation and not do anything at home. Um, I've spoken too long, I guess, and I will stop now because we need a lot of time for discussion, I guess. Thank you very much for organizing this, Lisa, and back to you. Thanks a lot, Jutta, for these um, great introductory uh, remarks. Uh, and sorry that I got the terminology wrong. Um, so thank you for correcting me that you are the shadow rapporteur. <laughs> Um, so, moving on, uh, I will now pass the floor to Kitty Nitriai. She um, has 14 years of experience working for the European Commission. Uh, most recently, she has been a member of cabinet of the Energy Commissioner um, Katri Simpson, where the methane strategy was part of her portfolio. And now, uh, actually since three days or four days, she is head of unit at DG Energy, where she is, among other things, responsible for decarbonization and sustainability of energy sources. So um, Kitty Nitai, please tell us a little bit more about the status quo of the implementation of the EU methane strategy. What's uh, the European Commission going to tackle next in the um, upcoming month? Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Sasha. And thank you, Honorable Member Jutta Paulus. Indeed, uh, a lot has been said, so I can really focus my points on, uh, on what we're doing now. So, the first, maybe just to reiterate what, what has been said already, but from a different perspective, is that methane being a short-lived climate pollutant, it's, it has a much stronger uh, global warming potential than CO2, but this also means that, the, and, and it stays in the atmosphere for a shorter period of time, but it also means that the sooner we take action, the sooner we see the impacts. So if we immediately manage to cut methane emissions, we see a much quicker impact on the global warming than uh, acting on CO2. So that's why also maybe another reason why we should be doing something about uh, methane as quickly as possible. I very much agree to focus today's discussion on the energy sector. Indeed, when we coordinated the strategy, we have included, uh, we wanted to have um, a comprehensive strategy, so included also waste, waste management and, uh, and uh, agriculture. But uh, it is indeed in the energy sector where the reduction potential is most cost effective and can be done, done quicker and when, where very little has been done so far. So we can really start um, with action on, on the European side as well. Interestingly enough, the EU is an area which is lagging behind actually on, uh, on tackling methane emissions. For example, we report currently according to the lowest uh, UN standards. And um, so, so our data, the data that we can base our strategies and our actions on uh, is actually not particularly reliable because instead of being based on actual measurements, they're yeah, based on, uh, on, on standards or default values. So in some cases, they might actually underestimate the real emissions. So when we were drafting our strategy, we immediately identified as the first uh, action point to, to impose uh, obligations for proper measurements, reporting and verification of methane emissions uh, within the EU. In other parts of the world, such uh, measurements already are applicable. So we also have to live up to our leading role in the climate change as the European Union and also tackle the, the measurements within the EU. So what we're currently actually working on is the legislation, as you said, Lisa, uh, due for the end of the year, which will make this proposal for, for measurements, uh, reporting and verification on the EU side in order to have reliable data. That said, action needs to start immediately. So we cannot wait for the data to become available and then analyze it before we take action because then we lose opportunities, we miss opportunities to reduce and, and fight the emissions immediately. And there are some actions that we consider that we can be taking without waiting for 100% accurate data. And that's exactly leak detection and repair as already Honorable Member Yuta Palu said. We know that methane emissions are quite diffuse, so they can, there are some super emitters within the European Union as well and globally as well. But besides those super emitters, which are responsible for a big chunk of the methane emissions, 
the rest of the emissions are very, very diffuse. So it is, uh, we have to tackle this and we have to install more precise measurement equipment and those exist already. So we we'll hear from industry best practices that uh, where leaks are more probable, they install fixed meters. And uh, also with modern drone technology, they can uh, survey areas and, and to look for, for, for methane emissions. So building on these practices, we would like to really also um, put forward legislation that obliges um, operators to, to install practices of leak detection and repair and to in immediately start reducing the, 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 the emissions. Of course, we, we are very happy about voluntary industry initiatives in this field. So um, Honorable Member already mentioned the OGMP, the Oil and Gas Methane Partnership, who have, uh, with a teaming up of, uh, of international companies um, who have uh, already agreed on very high level of measurement standards and uh, will uh, also commit to reduce their own emissions uh, before the end of the year. And we are working to extend the scope uh, for, for a larger um, uh, shares of the business so as to cover a larger part of the emissions. And this is also good from an international perspective because as already said before, indeed, the EU is actually a smart, smart, small emitter in terms of uh, global emissions, but we do import part of the emissions together with the fossil fuels that we import into the EU. And indeed, in the strategy, we also put forward the importance on having the full life cycle uh, emissions measurements for all the, all the fuels that we consume in the EU. So this is what we would like to also um, work on in the future and where the OGMP actually is already a very good initiative because it is it has a global scope. But just to say where we are now with the initiatives that we have announced in the international field. So we announced to, to support the creation and the setting up of the International Methane uh, Observatory, Methane Emissions Observatory. And there an implementation committee is being set up uh, in order to make this uh, become operational. And um, we, we are also very happy on the international side that the, that the Council has supported us. So we have the conclusions of the, of the energy and climate diplomacy from January that have also put the emphasis on the need uh, of, of, of uh, fighting methane emissions in the international context. And this is very good that we do not only have the support of the European Parliament for our policies, but also from the, from the Council of Member States. Um, what we indeed wanted to do is to improve the, first of all, the transparency. So improve the information about the, the, the oil and gas that is consumed within the European Union so that we can truly make informed choices about uh, the fossil fuels that we consume. And um, it is, um, of course, one, one, one way or our immediate action in line with the strategy is to focus on diplomatic actions. And here, of course, we are very, very happy to have the U.S. back on board and the Biden-Harris Biden administration putting a strong focus on, uh, on uh, fighting methane emissions in the United States. So having uh, our partner back uh, in, in this debate, together with already other partners that we have had, like uh, Canada uh, and others who have already uh, very, very reliable methane, measure, methane uh, emissions measures. So we are going to come com cooperate with our partners. So we are continue our cooperation and we have already incorporated the methane emissions in all our bilateral dialogues with different uh, countries, especially with producer countries, but also with consumer countries. And uh, we will continue doing that. And we will also uh, pursue these discussions also in the international context. So in the G20, in the, in the United Nations discussions in order to make even more progress possible at the international level, because we do indeed uh, depend on the cooperation of our international par partners. So I think that's all from my side as a way of introduction and then happy to, happy to take the debate. Thank you so much. Um, we already have the first few questions in the chat, so please, dear pa participants, continue to use the uh, chat function and we will um, forward the questions towards the um, end of the debate. So, uh, the next speaker in line is now Konstantin Zerga from the Deutsche Umwelthilfe. He is heading the Energy and Climate Program at the Environmental Action Germany. 
And before that, he has also worked for the Deutsche Bahn, so the German uh, railway company. So he also has some experience in the private sector. Um, and he has worked extensively on different issues around gas. And the latest accomplishment is a market survey on methane emissions from natural gas companies. It was released uh, two or three weeks ago. Um, so Deutsche Umwelthilfe together with Urgewalt prepared a questionnaire on methane emissions from the natural gas value chain and send it to 19 companies that are active in the natural gas industry to find out whether they are measuring emissions and taking steps to reduce them. And I'm now looking forward to hearing about some key results and main takeaways. Please, Konstantin, the next 10 minutes are yours. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Um, I'm sharing a few slides. I hope that's working and you are able to see them. Also, thanks for, to Jutta for hosting us uh, here in the virtual parliament today. Um, yes, um, looking back to last autumn when the Commission published its methane strategy, we thought it might be worthwhile to start a little experiment. And um, the experiment was that we wanted to know what do companies uh, along the supply chain actually know about their upstream methane emissions. Um, and we started that experiment because um, in the course of the discussion that um, took place before the methane strategy was adopted, um, there was a lot of talk about voluntary actions and um, as an environmental NGO, and maybe in particular as an environmental NGO from Germany, uh, I must say we um, have a natural skepticism when it comes to voluntary action from industry um, based on experiences we made in the past. Um, but well, actors can change, companies can change, industry can change, and it's also another industry maybe. So um, we wanted to know uh, what do they actually know about their methane emissions, and we thought it would be worthwhile to ask this question. So we sent out that questionnaire um, where we um, wanted to know what strategies do companies uh, implement to um, get data and to reduce methane emissions. Uh, we wanted to know what actually are methane emissions and uh, what do companies do to reduce methane emissions um, in practice. And um, we decided to send the, those questionnaires not only to companies um, in the extraction business, uh, but also to gas traders. And we did that deliberately because uh, Germany is a um, huge importer of natural gas. It's the biggest gas market in Europe. We were not only focusing on German companies, but uh, we think it's absolutely crucial that um, all companies along the supply chain take responsibility. So we extended the scope um, in this little survey. Um, now I'm trying to flip to the next slide. Um, maybe to begin, um, I want to um, have a look at the size of the problem we are talking about. And what you're seeing here is that Germany is importing or using 87 billion cubic meters of uh, natural gas annually, um, most of it imported. And um, then um, we tried to um, uh, make different assumptions about um, methane leakage ranges. Those are those uh, yellow um, bubbles you uh, see here. Um, and if you would burn those 87 billion cubic meters of uh, fossil gas, um, then um, you would release 150 million tons of CO2. So um, with no upstream emissions, um, assuming that um, you would uh, get 150 million tons of CO2. And what you can easily see, um, what, you, what you realize is that the higher leakage rates are, of course, the higher the total carbon footprint of that natural gas will be. Um, and assuming a leakage rate of, um, let's say, 3% will already double um, the uh, total uh, greenhouse gas footprint um, of the natural gas imported. So it's absolutely crucial that we know what the numbers are. We don't know it today. We have in particular for our most important um, um, supplier for Russia, um, no independent data, um, nothing that can be independently checked. So um, we think it's absolutely crucial uh, when we look at that um, to get better data. And um, this is also why we think that uh, all companies along the supply chain, also gas, also gas traders and utilities need to ask this question and that they need to have a strategy how to reduce that. Moving ahead, um, 
what's the list of companies um, we asked. Um, there were 19 companies on the list. Uh, we, after we published this, we got a lot of proposals, um, who else to ask, and we will be happy to do that um, this year again. Uh, we intend to um, have the survey every year now, um, quite exciting task. Um, and when you look at that, then only two companies actually responded to the full questionnaire, Unipa and Fortum, which are um, closely connected, of course. Then five companies um, um, answered the questions or tr at least tried to do so by either sending statements or um, in some cases also their CSR reports. And then the majority of companies uh, didn't answer at all. And we really put an effort to collect all um, answers. So we didn't only send an uh, email to some uh, anonymous um, email address, but we followed that up individually. Um, what's interesting is that we had a number of um, discussions um, behind the scenes, um, and I can't um, say the names of those companies, but that was really exciting because um, in those cases, we were really starting at the very beginning. So there was one big utility um, active all over Europe um, and we had a meeting with the head of gas trading and uh, the conversation started with the question why does methane actually matter so what is this about and we were starting to talk about the greenhouse gas effect um, and why he should care so um, that tells me that um, there's a long long way to go um, I my guess is that companies working in the extraction business are probably rather aware of, of the issue, but companies along when you move um, higher in the supply chain, then there's really a long way to go to actually uh, bring this on the table and bring this to the attention of management. So um, first result here is um, and conclusion for us that this is um, more or less shocking that we didn't get more answers. And of course, we would see much, much more um, transparency when it comes to the management methane emissions are also more willingness to answer questions like these. Um, that's the first result. I already mentioned that there are too, com too few companies uh, dealing with the issue. Um, then a second uh, result is that uh, in many cases, the credo is um, announced instead of act. So in the answers we got, then um, it was pretty clear that most companies um, are announcing action, are announcing to join an initiative, are announcing to ask for data, but only very few companies are actually doing so and can prove that. And um, we still think that this is a problem. Well, and then finally, um, another result is that um, there is um, no recognition of the urgency of a determined phase out of fossil gas. And I think that's also an important part of the story. Of course, we need to reduce methane emissions as fast as possible. And uh, we also need natural gas companies to do that. But we shall not forget that uh, natural gas, fossil gas is a fossil fuel. And um, when we talk about uh, carbon climate neutrality, then we need to phase this fossil fuel out as well. And companies need a strategy for that. So um, coming to my um, more or less final slide here, um, we think that we have to adopt some kind of product responsibility along, so, along the supply chain. It's not there yet. It's uh, still for many companies a um, new issue. I know there are front runners. Um, I acknowledge that. And I'm also um, um, uh, looking forward to, um, uh, to our debate where we are also going to have um, Julia Schmidt here. Um, but uh, the majority of companies still needs um, yeah, a clear message that they have to consider methane emissions then um, we think um, that companies must carry out their own measurements of methane emissions. Um, they need to involve their suppliers and trading partners. We had one very interesting discussion with a big gas trader who uh, tried to find ways. He was telling us that he had several thousands of transactions at one of the European gas hubs. Um, but um, then it turned out that um, about 80% of the, those um, transactions were with the same supplier. So it, it was quite easy to actually ask this question. Um, so we were able to start, um, or was, we were able to give him some uh, food for thought in that case. There are ways also to make this possible. Um, then we think it's very important that companies must present a strategy for the face of, of, of natural gas and the reduction of methane emission. This will go along. So reducing methane emissions can't be an excuse to continue burning fossil fuels in the long run. Well, and 
what do we need for that? We need strong regulation from the European Union. We need a strong implementation of the EU methane strategy. Um, we can't rely on voluntary actions only, and we can't rely only on uh, measures and regulation improving data, but we also need strong regulation that's actually, actually triggering reduction measures. Uh, and I think there are some proposals on the table, something like a methane levy, um, which has been discussed. Um, I think Mark is also giving us an input on the performance standard. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and um, we can't make one step after the other here. We have to make both steps at once, uh, which obviously has its challenges, but nevertheless is uh, possible. So um, those uh, were my slides and my um, remarks, I guess. Um, we will share this uh, later and you will be able to download that. And there's also, of course, the complete study available uh, if you want to have a closer look um, for now. Thanks and I'm looking forward to our debate. Thank you, Constantine. That was very clear. Um, and I invite all our participants to really have a look at the entire um, document. Uh, it's really uh, worth reading and um, yeah, very clear conclusion can be drawn from that. There are a few questions directed um, to you, uh, Constantine, but um, in order not to lose too much time, I would invite you to uh, type a few quick answers into the chat. I think that's, uh, that's feasible. Um, and I will now pass the floor to Mark Brownstein from the Environmental Defense Fund or short EDF. He is the senior vice president of energy at the EDF and a member of EDF's executive team. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the EDF is a United States-based nonprofit environmental advocacy group. Um, and he leads EDF's energy program global globally with a focus on halting the rise of global oil and gas emissions on a path that is actually consistent with uh, the climate neutrality goal by 2050. And if you look up Mark online, you will soon see that he has dealt with methane emissions from the gas industry for a long time. And he has written numerous um, blogs that are really um, worthwhile. So I highly recommend them to you. So he will now share some insights on how um, we could regulate methane emissions because we saw that this is uh, definitely necessary. So um, please Mark, tell us a little bit more about the different options that are um, on the table. Sure. Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank you to everyone who helped put this forum together and for including EDF and myself in the conversation. Very much uh, appreciate that and appreciate very much the focus today on methane emissions. Uh, we have been working on this for a very long time, uh, and much has been said about the importance of addressing methane. Um, the science is compelling. And in fact, my colleague, Alyssa Akko, just released a paper uh, last Tuesday, which underscores the fact that we can get a 30% decrease in warming right now uh, from methane emission reductions. Um, and as importantly, in a, you know, that um, under any of the decarbonization scenarios that we're familiar with, methane emissions don't go down until mid-century which is to say that uh, we can't uh, simply assume that because we're aggressively pursuing decarbonization that we will somehow along the way uh, as a byproduct address methane emissions. We need concerted action on methane emissions, particularly from the oil and gas sector, in parallel to everything that we are doing uh, to decarbonize our economy. So we need to do both. That's my first point. Uh, my second point is uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we can do about these emissions, but I want to do it in the context of the European Commission's excellent methane strategy document, which we believe lays out a very um, comprehensive and sensible blueprint for action. Um, but of course, as we all know, uh, it's one thing to be able to articulate the conceptual path forward is quite another thing to implement the, um, the necessary measures to make those words, uh, you know, come to life. Um, so let me uh, talk a little bit about each step and, and the options that we see as available. So first of all, in the methane strategy, uh, there is talk of domestic regulation. And that, and we agree, that is step number one. 
it is very difficult, I think, for any country to, um, uh, you know, make a, a, a play for global leadership if they're not willing to take action at home first. Uh, and so, um, although Europe is not a huge oil and gas producer, nonetheless, there are significant oil and gas production activities in place in Europe. And of course, there are significant amounts of oil and gas that, trend, that transverse the continent. And a basic set of regulations to address emissions, not only for production, uh, but also a transportation of gas through pipelines and the like, uh, is incredibly important. And here, there is a lot of, uh, of um, experience to draw upon. Uh, in the United States, um, we have a number of major oil and gas producing states who have enacted comprehensive regulations for leak detection and repair. Um, and of course, most recently, we have the US Senate acting to reimpose federal requirements on new sources that were adopted during the latter days of the Obama administration in 2016. And, uh, in, in, and in that action, the US Senate is a, a more or less directing the Environmental Protection Agency to not only just reimpose the existing set of regulations, but to take necessary steps to improve those regulations and expand them to cover existing sources. Uh, we are told to expect those proposed regulations sometime in the fall, maybe as early as September for both new and existing sources. And so uh, we think that there is a lot of, um, of precedent and experience to draw upon from what's happening in the United States. But even aside from the United States, Canada has comprehensive uh, methane abatement regulations, the province of Alberta, the province of British Columbia, uh, even Mexico has adopted uh, oil and gas methane regulations. Uh, all of these become, I think, good source material for the work that the Commission is doing to put together Europe's regulatory framework. The second step, of course, uh, as has been mentioned, is the question of how to manage uh, imports. Um, Europe, uh, as I think everyone on this gathering knows, is the world's largest import market for natural gas, whether you're talking about gas that comes in by a pipeline or through LNG. And so this creates a special opportunity for Europe and also a special responsibility to take action, not just on emissions associated with gas produced in the union, but gas that's consumed in, in the union. And of course, there's a number of precedents for Europe uh, setting policy on consumer goods coming into the union, meeting standards that closely align with domestic standards. Uh, and so we don't, so we, we as a practical matter think that there's plenty of precedent within Europe's own regulatory framework to address the emissions associated with gas in the same way as it does with other products uh, imported into the, into the union. Um, but here, uh, what we see is, is that we see a number of, of industry-led initiatives to begin to delineate low methane gas. I can think of at least four or five individual industry consortia that are currently working on developing ways to certify gas as low methane. So certainly, or zero methane. So certainly the industry recognizes that this is a need for them to be able to demonstrate that they can deliver gas to customers without, uh, or with minimal or no methane emissions. But I think this poses a special challenge to Europe because if you will, a cacophony of voluntary industry approaches um, may only serve to confuse consumers in Europe and may only serve to, um, um, uh, you know, increase uh, uncertainty in European gas markets and work to the disbenefit, not only of environmental policy in Europe, but the European goal of a common transparent and liquid energy market. And so uh, the act of setting a European standard through action by the European Commission and the European policy parliament 
uh, is not only an act of good environmental policy, it may also be an act of good um, economic policy. Uh, the good news here, of course, is, is that there are precedents for how to do such a thing. Uh, both Norway and New Zealand already have standards in place that are essentially pricing mechanisms for, uh, for methane. And so these serve as good precedent for how Europe might be able to take action on a uniform basis. And as well, uh, there's legislation that's been introduced into the United States Senate by Senator uh, Whitehouse from the state of Rhode Island, which uh, um, also comes up with a performance standard and pricing mechanism uh, and uses a default emission rates as a way of setting those standards which kind of suggests that there are ways to move forward on this trajectory, even while Europe works to improve reporting and, um, and, and verification, which we certainly support. Um, let me just say, uh, in, finally, that, um, that this becomes really important too, because as we've seen in the United States, when NG, uh, the large French energy company, um, canceled the contract for LNG supply from the Permian Basin based on emissions coming from the Permian Basin, this sent a shockwave through the US oil and gas market. Uh, we think it's one of the reasons why now industry is supporting US regulation of methane emissions in the oil and gas sector, because they know that as a matter of commercial survivability, they need to have this issue addressed. So it shows the impact that European policy can have on producers around the world, but it also underscores the need for some kind of uniform standard. So again, um, um, Europe's energy markets remain uh, transparent and in balance through the period of transition. Last point I'll make is, is that Europe is the third point in the strategy document that I think is really worth highlighting is Europe's commitment to developing international institutions that can help do a better job of monitoring and measuring emissions. Um, we think that these will be an important complement to the policy that Europe is in play, putting, would put in place. Uh, we also think it's an incredible service to the global community that Europe would take such a leadership position. We're working very hard uh, in the United States to make sure that the United States joins the European Commission in its commitment to support of IMEO and the CCAC um, and hope that we can you know, see uh, this as an opportunity for collaboration between the two, uh, between the two um, uh, political entities uh, in the coming months. So with that, I'll stop there and uh, look forward to our conversation. Thanks a lot, Mark Brownstein, also for bringing in that um, American perspective on the debate, not only from a US American uh, point of view, but also you mentioned some provinces in Canada, like BC and Alberta. So I'm looking forward to the panel discussion now. Um, this is an opportunity for uh, you participants to ask questions again. I've seen them uh, already uh, in the chat, but if you have more, don't hesitate to ask them in the chat. Now um, all the panelists and speakers will be given the opportunity to take the floor again. Plus we have um, a new addition to the panel. Um, so I'm pleased to welcome Julia Schmidt. Um, she's a geologist by training and she has worked for um, Winter, the German oil and gas company. Um, in different countries and different functions ever since she graduated. So she brings in, um, yeah, she can bring in a lot of experience to the, debate, to the debate now. And since one year, she has the program lead on the methane guiding principles, which her company joined in 2017. So thank you, Julia Schmidt, for joining us and for providing some insights from uh, within the industry itself. And the opening question to the panel um, therefore goes to you. Um, in your view, is the industry aware of the extent of the problem and what are the barriers to address methane emissions? And we also had a couple of questions in the chat. Why was there so much silence when it came to the questionnaire? Which, yeah, what, what are the barriers for companies to um, act better on methane emissions and which political framework conditions um, would you want to see from the EU? 
Yeah, th thank you, Lisa, and thank you also to the organizers uh, for for having me here in this discussion. Actually, I was preparing a kind of dark, um, some five minute statement, but maybe I don't know. Maybe it makes more sense to start with questions like like uh, you did, because a lot of what I would like to reflect on, uh, I think, fits pretty much to the to the questions. Um, maybe just very briefly on the methane strategy, which we as uh, Windows Idea very much welcome because it, it's, it sets really a signal and it has triggered a lot of all both company internal but also external communication like what we see today, I think is one of the results of it and in my company. Uh, really, uh, during the last year since I've taken the position, uh, ha the topic has gotten an enormous uh, push uh, and, and uh, we are uh, also willing to, to contribute here uh, and uh, many, many things that are anchored in the EU, EU methane strategy are, are exactly the way how we would um, tackle the topic. Solid database, setting the baseline right, getting more data confidence, but also take action, take uh, meaningful action, not necessarily always looking at costs, because uh, I think that's the only way how can we, we can uh, get started. And by the way, I don't think that we really ne uh, need to, to wait on the database uh, to, to improve. Uh, we have joined uh, OGMP2 uh, or also last year, and uh, maybe um, to give you also, and, and, and pays into why, why maybe a questionnaire is always a difficult thing to do. I mean, the, the OGMP reporting template, I don't know if uh, you have seen it, it's just about to be uh, filled out for the first time uh, to be uh, submitted to UNEP end of May. It contains only for the upstream part, 14 different sources of emissions uh, broken up into five levels of accuracy and each level uh, is uh, so, you know, the gold standard can only be achieved if you have level four or five and you have very stringent rules that uh, tell you exactly how you have to measure, how you have to quantify the data uh, to, um, uh, to fulfill these requirements. Uh, maybe on, on our journey now preparing all these reports, uh, we, we don't, don't step back from, from doing this. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of work. Honestly, uh, because it also includes the reporting of non-operated assets, so we have to get in touch for all our assets uh, with all the partners and in some uh, areas also with authorities to just get the approval to share the pure emission data with a third party, which is in this case UNEP. So we have to really turn a big administrative uh, wheel. Uh, to allow only this and, and some yeah here asset specific information uh, and it it uh, it is it's not clear if we get the permit everywhere we, we try we, we we go for it and uh, we already obtained a, quite a number of, of approval from NOCs from from state companies to share the data so I think uh, we are in a good way and I think everybody outside and those who we are talking about they are more and more um, getting aware of. Of, of the topic and how we can tackle it. So maybe that is that is also something why uh, why it is always difficult on responding on questionnaires because you have always to explain to your operators to the authorities what is going to happen with the information. If this is not clear, we will in I, I my guess would be ninety percent of the cases would not get partner approval even if we would be willing to contribute here. So um, that that is maybe something behind uh, it, and I would not uh, overestimate here uh, the the response uh, frequency. At least speaking from the upstream part, given the fact that we are operating, and I think uh, Jutta mentioned it, most of the emissions and also the gas produced outside of the European uh, community. Good, so maybe just one thing and also with, with respect to uh, what, what Mark said, uh, we are very much welcoming uh, stringent regulation, also for the reason because it would help us in, uh, in uh, contacting the host countries of the, of, of the emissions or the production to say, this is the legislation that we have to follow. Um, we, we need to talk about it. We have already uh, know how, how to reduce, uh, for example, uh, routine flaring, which is in parts of the world still state of the art. 
um, why they should interrupt their production, why they should invest into, uh, into low emission technologies. Um, that would give us a very strong backing. So we very much welcome strong uh, legislation and we even uh, welcome a performance-based approach here uh, that, that will uh, kind of uh, also help us and, and trigger uh, a level playing field uh, externally, also outside the EU. That's what I mean. Thank you. So with that, I would like to hand back to you, Lisa, for the next question. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to pick up the um, oil and gas methane partnership uh, issue because you talked about how difficult it was to get the data stand in a standardized form um, for the upstream part, etc. And we had two questions in the chat uh, regarding developing a methodology. Um, so we had uh, Frida Keeninger from Food and Water Europe um, who asked, for instance, uh, the EU Commission considers basing legislation on the uh, OGMP MER MRV methodology. So what about the conflict of interest in asking um, methane polluters to propose a methodology on monitoring and reporting on methane? Um, so um, maybe uh, Kitini Trai, you would like to um, answer that one and maybe Jutta as well. And you're of course welcome to react to any Thing that you have heard from uh, the other speakers as well in your comments. Thank you very much. So, I mean, maybe just to clarify one thing, the OGMP is a voluntary initiative, which we support in the sense that uh, we very much welcome that companies get together and they develop very high levels of standards uh, and really industry best practice, and that they voluntarily commit to the reduction of their methane emissions. So this is a, an initiative that we support, but what we do in, in uh, or not in parallel, but what we have started doing is developing the legislation. So to propose binding rules on, uh, or ideally this is what we're aiming for, binding rules on monitoring, reporting and verification and uh, leak detection and repair. And what I forgot to mention, but it came in the chat. Also, we are looking into the possibility to to ban routine venting and flaring. So these are kind of the immediate mitigation measures that we are looking into. Now coming to the monitoring and reporting, we of course are looking into industry best practice. So if we find uh, things to improve, then we will put of course uh, that into the legislation. But for the moment, what we have found uh, out there as the, the highest level of reporting standard is actually the OD OGMP 2.0 methodology. So if we can add uh, any improvements to that, we will, but then we just have to see what needs to be still improved in that methodology. And so we are very much looking at it and, and analyzing it. And just maybe also to flag that we had a, a questionnaire, a very detailed questionnaire for public consultation and the public consultation closed uh, this Saturday, so on the 1st of May. And uh, we did receive uh, around uh, 180 replies from, from different, uh, um, even private citizens, uh, companies, NGOs. So we, we are very much looking into those uh, contributions because we also wanted to use this occasion to gather more information because there is uh, some information out there, but we are very much also building still knowledge on, uh, on, on this file in order to propose our, our legislation by the end of the year. So, but what we can already draw as a conclusion from the, from the questionnaire that there is actually quite a lot of support for, for all the, the, the measures that we, we are envisaging on, on measurement reporting and verification, leak detection and repair, and also on the venting and the flaring. So I think we, are, we start from a, from a strong uh, support position in order to develop our legislation. And maybe if I can come back to one of the other comments that we had on, uh, on the role of natural gas in the, in the, in the transition. Because on the one hand, of course, we very much speak about methane because that's also natural gas. But uh, we have to know that the, the emissions are actually much bigger in some instances in the oil production because that's where you have the associated gases that are just released in the atmosphere or, or flared. So uh, natural gas is, is an important factor, but there's also oil and gas and, uh, and coal mines. But coming back to, to the end of year package that we are working on, we do actually... Uh, tackle the other side of it as well, and that is what you mentioned before, the, the use of natural gas and the role of natural gas in our long-term uh, climate neutrality objective. So we are also looking into, into redesigning our, our gas markets 
or gases markets in order with a view to replace gradually natural gas that is today 96 percent of uh, of the gas we use in the system by more renewable gases uh, such as green hydrogen etc so we also want to indeed accompany or facilitate this uh, a gradual replacement of of natural gas by cleaner alternatives Thank you. And maybe adding on to that, um, you mentioned the long term role of gas, well, the current role and also the long term role uh, on our road towards climate neutrality. And we had a question in the chat, uh, one from Maria from E3G. Do you think it makes sense to push the newly established Net Zero Producers Forum, which the US also joined, to include methane emissions in their agenda? And um, linked to that one is also uh, the, to the long term net zero debate, do you have any suggestions on how to make sure methane mitigation measures and um, similar initiatives are not abused for uh, PR and greenwashing and neglect kind of the long-term perspective of fossil gas uh, and de uh, designed phase out? Jutta, maybe you want to pick up on that and then Mark as well. Yes, I, I guess Kitty has already outlined it pretty well. And of course, um, I will strive for the highest standards possible and I will be grateful for any input coming from scientists, from NGOs, also from operators that are actually working on um, equipment with which you could measure those emissions um, more precisely or more easily or at a lower cost so that we can implement all this knowledge into the most ambitious legislation possible. Of course, it is, it is always walking the line because um, it's difficult to put pressure on the industry and at the same time, making it very clear that we have to phase out fossil fuels as soon as possible. So on the one hand, we say you must invest in order to stay in business in the EU, but you will not stay in business very long anyway, because we're planning to phase out fossil fuels. So this is a very difficult task. I acknowledge that, but um, it's it's nothing that we could we could really make amends. I mean, we need to phase out fossil fuels, but we need to let's say work at the steps which are which deliver the most progress um the quickest and there we are back to methane being such a strong greenhouse gas um actually what we have seen is that pricing methane emissions does make a difference. We have also seen it in Europe with Norway applying the tax on, um, on methane emissions and then the no Norwegian companies um, acting very quickly on their um, emissions and now as far as I know they are one of the they are among the producers with the lowest um, fugitive methane emissions in the world. Um, but unfortunately, we as the EU cannot price methane emissions taking place in the Permian Basin or in Siberia. So we have to apply other measures. And my um, proposal would be that we work toward a certification system so that we have actually in the, in the same way as we have it when it comes to energy efficiency, there is a sort of label for a producer saying, okay, this is an ABCDE producer. Because increasingly we see that the, um, the customers also want to know where does my supply come from? Is my producer acting responsibly? So it's our job as legislators to make sure that there is a reliable system. Because what we also see throughout the world is private companies springing up saying, hey, we'll do the certification, no problem. And I tend to be a bit skeptic on the reliability on those of those private companies. We have seen it in other sectors when you give those um, more or less regulatory um, issues to private private bodies, you might not end up with the most reliable label at the end of the day. So I would really prefer the EU already showing the way towards a certification system based on very reliable data. And I'm very glad that Kitty took this up in her introduction saying measurement is not enough. We have to act now. Thank you. Yeah, if I could, uh, if I could just uh, second those comments, 
I think that uh, I think that there is, uh, you know, skepticism around various industry efforts to do self certification. I think, to be clear, I think many of those efforts can help, you know, educate industry to the issue and the opportunities and help uh, on a peer to peer basis improve uh, you know, the understanding about measurement and, and data recording. And I think that that's all to the good. But I think if we're talking about what the general public will believe and is willing to believe, I think only when there is a uniform standard that's in, um, administered by uh, the European Union, will there be any confidence that um, that there is some kind of level playing field with integrity. So I think all of these voluntary measures ultimately lead to the inevitable need for Europe to establish a standard. Um, to the question of the Producers Alliance, I think the net, the Progressive Producers Alliance that the United States is hoping to catalyze, we think that that's a, a valuable uh, step. Maybe it's time for Europe to catalyze a, you know, a Europe, uh, a, a global consumer alliance of the major gas consumers, um, you know, Europe, uh, Korea, Japan, China, uh, because actually producers, we know as a, as a matter of uh, basic economics, producers respond to what the customers demand. Uh, and if the customers are demanding a cleaner product, producers need to follow. And of course, I think that that's the significance of what Julia is saying. You know, I hear her saying, give us some clear standards for us and all of our competitors to meet, and we will meet the challenge. But it's incumbent upon policymakers to be the people that set those clear standards. And I think that's, the good news is, is I think we have examples where this can be done, even with the information we have available to us today. Yes, and Mark, in the chat, and also Constantine, the question also goes to you. Um, how can the EU methane regulation make sure that the imported upstream emissions are not diverted to other parts of the world um, instead of Europe? And Constantine, I know that you have also published um, a few statements concerning um, a contribution on methane emissions. Maybe you want to elaborate a little bit on that um, as, a, as one approach to regulate methane emissions. And, well, first of all, I, I just think the size of the European market makes it difficult for any producer to simply ignore, um, you know, what what is happening here. Um, but that being said, I, I do think, and, and I think the Commission does a nice job of this in the strategy document, talking about the fact that Europe needs to be engaged on the international stage with international partners to make sure that not only um, uh, is Europe taking action domestically, but that there's coordinated action internationally. Um, and so I think that Europe pursuing some kind of performance or pricing standard for gas coming into the union, uh, would this becomes the basis for then conversation with other major gas uh, consuming countries, Japan, Korea, so on. Um, and in fact, I think we're already beginning to see some interest in that in, in Japan, where in fact, some of the large gas, con gas consumers in Japan are talking about standards for imported LNG. So I don't think it's so far-fetched, but I do think what it requires is, is leadership. Um, and leadership is in the form of not just intentions, but actual proposal. Here's how we're thinking about governing our gas market let us work together in developing a common approach so that collectively we've got a, a similar approach in our respective gas markets. Okay, Konstantin, how could that leadership look like in your view? Yes, thanks. And um, 
maybe I can make a connection to that very fine ruling of our constitutional court from last week, because um, the court said that, of course, international or climate change requires international cooperation. Otherwise, we will not be able to overcome this. So the government has been asked to do that. But then on the other hand, the constitutional court said that if this is not happening, this is not no excuse at all to um, wait with national actions. And I think this is so true. And it's also true for the debate we have here. Of course, we need international cooperation to reduce methane emissions. We need to be successful on a global scale, also because gas is a global commodity. But then on the other hand, uh, we need to show leadership as Mark has pointed out, and the European Union has the opportunity now to go ahead and to show that leadership. And I think if it does, then it's also going to change the global market. Um, what we proposed or what we are proposing is that um, the um, Commission introduces a methane levy um, connected to a default value also for um, imported gas. So um, in the absence of uh, actual data on upstream methane emissions, we would say let's use um, conservative um, default value, um, which is then the basis uh, for the levy. Um, then then um, if a company is able to prove that it's uh, actually better than that, then let's reduce that levy. Um, I think that would create a strong incentive to reduce emissions to start that and uh, at the same time to uh, improve uh, the data availability. Okay, of course, we need um, common methodology for that. So that's very, very important. And we also need to have some kind of um, certification um, so we can be sure that actually the standard is met and that it's sufficient to base a levy on this. But I think this would be an exciting way to um, also um, to also to bring European legislation forward. Um, could also use the uh, income from such a levy to um, again um, um, have a payback for uh, industry to enable industry to reduce emissions and to implement measures. Um, and I think that could be a really strong one. And that would be like my dream. Um, and um, as with that constitutional ruling, uh, another dream came true. So now climate change and combating climate change is a constitutional issue and value in Germany. And then I would be um, optimistic that we might be able to achieve something similar, something similar good uh, on a European level as well. Thank you for these um, quite optimist for this quite optimistic uh, intervention. Um, my next question would go to go back to Julia Schmidt. Um, so we have one in the chat concerning um, the introduction of concrete regulations and whether you think that this would also boost uh, investments of the industry um, or the yeah the willingness to invest in more uh, more in decarbonization technologies, emission removal technologies, but also others. And we also have quite a debate going on on uh, Nord Stream 2. I don't know if you were um, able to follow uh, the, the questions in the chat, but maybe you can pronounce yourself and your company's view on, on that. Um, okay, maybe I answer the first question first on, on if I believe that you will boost um, action. Um, I think that what I see in all, all these industry activities that I'm in, uh, already the, 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 the discussion around the methane um, strategy and now the following of potential regulation and, 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 and the, string, uh, the stringent way the regulation is implemented has already boosted the know-how and also uh, started more action because we, we, we are in the progress. We have many, many um, uh, within the methane guiding principles, we have uh, a lot of uh, very kind of high level equipped uh, from colleagues from the even uh, producing majors um, say how can we how can we get this topic on the ground how can we move uh, bring no know how to the countries that are not yet there in the understanding on, on what is the topic about and, and we see this outside Europe and now US is picking up on that but we have still countries that say oh um, it's still a cultural thing in some, some producing areas where you say, oh, the flare is burning, so the, the, the production is up and running, which is a good sign because my country is, is, is earning money on this. To do this, this change in mindset, I think uh, 
the EU can give a very strong signal say this is not the state of the art anymore you have to work on it and that will boost discussion it will also boost action and awareness so I, I very much uh, believe that this this will help uh, even if you say okay we are in the EU we are not producing so much gas but to say we we are not going to tolerate um, this anymore is is, is is the right way and it will help us in the discussions and it will also uh, kind of help also on the political uh, discussions uh, whenever you meet uh, in, in the different uh, forums uh, on the political level say why did you do this it would be because that's that's from all sides very clear and I think countries will pick up on that um, I'm pretty sure Lisa if I if I may interject here uh, because mention was made earlier of the Copernicus program the European Space Agency is sponsoring. And of course, when we think about satellites and we think about technologies like Copernicus, we think about mechanisms for accountability, holding companies accountable for uh, emissions and, and frankly, holding countries accountable for emissions. But I also think that there's a very important public education component to these kinds of programs because you know, the, the fundamental challenge with methane is, of course, is that it's invisible um, and it hasn't received the same level of attention as carbon dioxide. And yet we all know how powerful it is as a warming agent. I think there's just a lack of understanding, a lack of information in the public domain about the magnitude of these emissions and where they're coming from. Copernicus certainly helps contribute to better public understanding of this issue. Uh, it's the reason why uh, Environmental Defense Fund has been working on developing a satellite, which we'll have uh, up and running by, by 2023. The purpose of this is to create better understanding of the issue. Uh, and so therefore, it builds greater both uh, public support for action, it builds greater industry support for action. And yes, it's a tool for accountability, but first and foremost, it's, it's a tool for for, uh, for education. Um, and so these kinds of programs, the satellites, IMEO, uh, are incredibly important, both, uh, you know, both carrot and stick, if you will. Thank you. And I will just briefly pass the ball back to um, Julia Schmidt regarding the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So do you think it basically adds on to the problem? What is what is the position um, on Nord Stream 2? Um, and we also have a question on um, well, the future uh, of gas in a larger sense, especially with regards to hydrogen. How can we avoid that um, this uh, hype over hydrogen actually becomes an environmental disaster? This is a very large question, but maybe you can just say a few words on um, the industry's position, your company's position on that, on these two issues. Okay, maybe you have you have to to remind me on the second part. Maybe I, uh, from Nord Stream, of course, it's a highly political topic. So I'm a technologist. So forgive me. I would come here from the perspective of methane emissions. The way the the the, the pipeline is constructed is makes it impossible that you have. Uh, emissions in the pipeline that escape to to the water or somewhere we are and 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 we, you know we are uh, financing uh, Nord Stream we are not uh, kind of uh, what is the English word Gesellschaft so we have no direct influence here we can only get into communication say you have to also contribute to you are part of the value chain so uh, all your compressor stations things that are related to uh, putting the gas into the pipeline and landing it on and bringing it into the DSOs uh, and, and TSOs in Europe have to fulfill the same the same requirements uh, pretty clear. So my my uh, knowledge for for the, the the Nord Stream pipelines and there are two of them um, they are welded so they are not prone to uh, to any fugitive uh, emissions here. Political aspects uh, are, are not my uh, area of expertise, so I, I, I struggle here a little bit giving here. And I, I don't see the concrete question here, by the way. Maybe I screwed, it's too far maybe, up already. Maybe you want to briefly yeah. comment on the issue of blue hydrogen and the prospects of um, yeah, the gas industry on betting on this form of, of technology. Yeah, well, maybe one thing, blue hydrogen that is, that is manufactured out of imported gas if it's if it's created in in Europe or in Germany 
Uh, of course, then you have the value chain, the topic with the emissions. And, and uh, I'm also not a specialist how we you would kind of produce the blue, blue hydrogen. Yeah, of course, uh, blue hydrogen in, involves uh, CCS uh, at the same time, otherwise it would be uh, gray hydrogen. Uh, so that part has to be taken off, but that's not the topic of methane emissions. I mean, it, it's a facility topic, how you produce produce uh, the, the, the hydrogen out of the methane and how you uh, secure your facility integrity to avoid uh, emissions in course of the of the of the production of the of the of the, um, the blue hydrogen and uh, same counts for to Turkey's uh, hydrogen. So it's a, a product like every refinery, and that's the way I would see it. Not being an expert on on hydrogen uh, technology here. I hope this answers the question. Yes, thank you. And I believe that the Deutsche Umetiv also has some uh, expertise and um, and did a lot of research on this uh, Nord Stream 2 uh, methane nexus. Um, so maybe Constantine, you want to say a few words on that? Yeah, yes, indeed. Thanks. Well, um, I agree to the pipeline itself. Um, it's a new infrastructure, so it's probably not prone to methane leaks at all as it is brand new but um, actually we are currently challenging the permit um, for Nord Stream 2 to be allowed to be put in operation um, in court um, based on uh, upstream methane emissions. The um, thinking behind this is that um, in the original um, approval procedure upstream methane emissions have not been considered to be an issue and that's a while ago, that was before 2018. Um, in 2018, the uh, permit was issued. And after that, um, among others, the colleagues from EDF have published a number of new findings um, on upstream methane emissions, new um, methodologies were um, implemented. There were a number of scientific publications. Um, and we think that this needs to be applied also uh, here, um, as the permit says that new environmental issues need to be regarded um, um, if they are found or if they appear. And that's definitely the case uh, with the new knowledge we gained in, in recent years on, on, on methane emissions. So um, that's our challenge to Nord Stream 2, saying that um, the permit has to be questioned. This is why we are at court. Um, it's a very exciting case, I think, because um, this is not only true for Nord Stream 2, but also for other uh, fossil gas infrastructure. Um, and um, yeah, it's um, always connected to, to the production um, of, of, of uh, fossil gas. So the question is there. Um, at the end of the day, I think um, it's going to be really exciting how the court is going to decide in this case. And it's a challenge for Nord Stream 2. Definitely. Looking at the time, I will now address the last um, question, at least during that panel debate, to our representative from the European Commission, Kitty Mitrai. Um, so we have two questions that are still in the pipe in the pipeline. Um, one is how, well, basically, how does supporting fossil gas projects on the PCI list, so projects of common interest uh, that are financed at least partially with EU money and top EU priorities um, without assessing their impact on methane emissions fit with the do no harm principle. Um, and there was another question to you uh, concerning the role of the petrochemical industry in the methane strategy um, and how the European Commission intends to also include that given the important role um, of the plastics and petrochemical industry um, in, a, in a broader sense um, when we look at methane emissions along the entire supply chain. Okay, thank you very much. And in the meantime, I also take this occasion as we spoke so much about hydrogen to just flag that there's also the EU hydrogen strategy that was published last year where we put a clear priority on renewable hydrogen as the most compatible option with the long-term objectives, but also the most interesting from an EU industrial point of view, but also from a system integration point of view. So for, our man for managing our largely renewables-based electricity system. But coming back to the, to the, the I remember, I mean, what you refer to is the, the um, regulation on trans-European networks. So uh, there is, there has been this regulation, which we revised the, by the end of last year. So we have made, we have tabled a new proposal and that new proposal would actually exclude fossil gas projects from, uh, become, from the possibility to becoming a project of common interest. So in our proposal, the only thing that we had put forward 
um, is the possibility to support dedicated hydrogen pipelines, so infrastructures to transport hydrogen only, so not hydrogen blended with other um, methane, no, just hydrogen dedicated pipelines, because we do consider, and here there is also a link uh, between the hydrogen strategy, the 10E, and also the, the emissions, that, we, that hydrogen is a high value product and it should in the first place, go to those uh, industries where, where it brings the highest decarbonization potential, and that's in industry, in the steel industry, but also in the chemical industry. So this is the new proposal uh, of 10E that we have um, that we have tabled last December, and this is this is now being discussed both in the European Parliament and in the European in the Council of the European Union, so between member states and uh, and within the European Parliament after, um, among the different uh, rapporteurs and shadow rapporteurs. So we are very closely following where this discussion is going and of course helping both institutions with more and more explanations and 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 reasoning why we have tabled the proposal as it is. So our main objective is to defend this proposal as we have tabled it. That means not to include back uh, fossil gas infrastructures uh, as it used to be in the past. So really to keep it just for the future oriented infrastructures that is uh, dedicated hydrogen pipelines and at the local uh, level what we call smart um, smart gas grids at the local level in, in um, installations that enable the injection of decentrally produced renewable gases into the distribution grids and possibly there from the distribution grid to the transmission grids but we in our assessment, the projects that are now out there and under construction and have been supported in the past, they have been very important for addressing security of supplies issues in the in the past. I mean, let's not forget that Eastern Europe has been uh, in a very difficult situation, for example, in 2009, and that's uh, right after where the old uh, 10E program has started uh, supporting uh, gas uh, pipeline projects in order to address the security of supply issues. But we consider that with the, with the projects that are now uh, on on the way uh, of completion, these uh, security of supply issues will be addressed. So we really would like to keep the new proposal that we have on the table free from fossil gas assets. Thank you. And maybe just 30 seconds on the role of the petrochemical, petrochemical industry in the methane strategy. And for those of you that are interested in the topic, we are planning on having a webinar um, entirely dedicated to that topic very soon. So stay tuned. So please, just a few words and then um, I will close looking at the time. Actually, I don't have much to say about that. Uh, I mean, we, we work with all industries. We haven't uh, been aware particularly about the uh, petrochemical um, industry specific role or, or responsibility within the methane strategy. What we would like to work is, of course, with all, uh, all industries that use uh, those fossil fuels to really reduce the emissions, uh, both at the production, but also at the, at the moment of the consumption. Okay, thank you. So now the final question brings us back to the EU and, uh, methane strategy, with, which was uh, at the heart of this debate. And I will um, give the floor to the host of this parliamentary event, Jutta Paulus. And we also had one question that was dedicated to you, um, or uh, that was addressed to you. What are the areas where the position of the EU Parliament may potentially differ from the EU Commission's proposal? And what are, uh, according to you, the red lines of the EU Parliament? Um, this is a very interesting question, as we do not have a Commission proposal yet. So actually, I do hope that um, there will be no red lines and we will be perfectly in line with the Commission proposal because the Commission will write the most ambitious proposal one could ever imagine. So, of course, this is a wish list, uh, but I think we have discussed a lot of things today that um, might already make it clear where the priorities lie and which which errors we should not repeat, which have been done in other um, regulation. I mean, we have just um, listened a lot about on the fifth PCI list and, and the 10E regulation, which we are discussing right now in Parliament. But unfortunately, the fifth PCI list is based on valid legislation from 10 years ago. I do not, I, I'm no lawyer. I don't know how we could, um, well, remedy this this issue. It it is of course it would be great if we could um, 
just push away this old term irregulation and say, well, never mind, we're in a climate emergency, we should not look after this. But that's a very delicate issue because, um, I mean, Deutsche Umwelthilfe is suing um, against Nord Stream. Also, you have done tremendous, um, a tremendous work on, on air pollution by suing cities which did not oblige to legislation. So by um, now saying, well, we don't, we don't care for legislation uh, unless it suits our purposes. I don't think that's a, the route we should take because then you could challenge every single piece of legislation. Um, and if political majorities change, we might all wake up with um, a very uncomfortable uncom situation. But to come back to the, um, to the wrap up, which I'm supposed to do, I think we have heard very different perspectives. I have read a lot of interesting contributions also in the chat and I might be um, listening to the event again um, because you will thankfully put it online. I think it's increasingly clear that this is a major problem which needs to be tackled but rather sooner than later. I'm very glad that um, the European Commission has um, publicly announced that they will not will they will not wait for data but take action as soon as possible and it's it's the same thing with every environmental legislation you need one actor going forward one actor taking the leap and saying never mind about people telling us you will have a um a disadvantage an, disadvantage in competition, you have to do something. And the European Union is in the, well, lucky position to have a market of 450 million people and therefore still plays an important role in international legislation and also in climate diplomacy. And I think one part of our climate diplomacy should be to deploy ambitious legislation in our own remit instead of pointing with the fingers to others saying, well, why shouldn't China move first or USA move first or Russia move first? We have to, as we say in German, use the broom before our own, before our own door and then we can go to others and say, hey, we got a blueprint here. Why don't you adopt it? We have made great experience with it. I'm glad that I have so many allies in my personal fight against methane emissions. And um, thank you very much again, Lisa, for organizing all this. And thanks to all our distinguished panelists for your input. Thank you so much, everyone. I will keep it very short to conclude. So I think um, we can all agree that something needs to happen. The problem is urgent. Data is more and more clear on why reducing methane emission is so important, um, why including the entire supply chain is absolutely necessary in order to um, even have, keep the possibility of reaching Paris um, climate targets. There is readily available technology that is um, that can be implemented at low cost. So we should finally pick these low hanging fruits, which was uh, also criticized in the comments that we have talked about that for a long time, that data knowledge gaps are uh, known for a long time. So these emissions uh, can be reduced and nevertheless, um, the, uh, even though the emissions can be reduced, even at low costs, they cannot be eliminated. So we should keep in mind that it is important to uh, always design phase out plans as well, uh, not only given the climate impact, but also other environmental impacts and also the uncertain economic prospects of, um, of fossil gas. And last but not least, and Yuta also said that at the very beginning, um, that was not the focus of the event, but uh, we must not forget other areas of methane emissions that contribute very heavily to the problem, most notably agriculture, where the European Union really has um, a lot of leeway with the common agriculture policy, which is still such a large budget that is dedicated um, to this policy area and that needs to be aligned also with the methane strategy. So thank you so much for participating to um, all of you. Thank you for being so active in the chat. Thank you for the Deutsche, um, to the Deutsche Umwelthilfe for the organization of this event and Jutta Paulus, our host. Thank you to all the wonderful panelists. The recording will be uploaded on our YouTube channel, so you can share that and watch it again, uh, just like Jutta. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, we will continue to work on the issue. Um, take care and goodbye. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you Bye. very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye.
，拜拜。